my name is Philip, and I'm here to share my journey and hopefully inspire some current young entrepreneurs and the future ones that are coming. I was born in Kenya. Uh, I was born as a refugee. Uh, I was born to Charles Ngarambe, Maureen Chibukaire. I have eight siblings. Um, due to their ethnical backgrounds, my parents uh, had to experience refugee or once were a refugee at some point under the genocidal regime that was ruling uh, Rwanda pre-genocide. Many Tutsis moved around seeking different opportunities elsewhere uh, due to lack of human rights and avoiding being prosecuted or being murdered uh, for their ethnic background. My parents met in Kenya. My dad was born in Rwanda. Uh, my mom was born in Uganda, lived in Kenya. Uh, around, I think, 1987, my dad left for uh, higher learning and uh, later on quit and became a businessman in Mombasa where he met my mother who studied uh, in Kenya and Uganda. But later on, she actually joined the liberation struggle with the RPF, not out of choice, but due to circumstances and definitely wanting to come back home. After the Rwanda Patriotic Front uh, stopped the genocide against Tutsis in Rwanda around 15th of July, 1994, my father decided it was time for us to move back home. My mom stayed behind uh, due to many other reasons. Their marriage failed. It was a very confusing time for a young person, but uh, I remember feeling like there was no space for me to even discuss this because my father at the time was dealing with too many things, having lost family members, having lost friends. So you kind of picked up with that and you just kept on moving. Um, gro growing up in Rwanda was not ideal due to the environment post-genocide, especially being born in Nairobi, where Nairobi was going through its peak economic time. So some of you might know Nairobi, Yaya Center, now being brought into Rwanda where there's literally chaos everywhere. I remember one of my first days at school, and I think it was 95, I remember seeing a row of dead bodies. And um, just right in front of the famous hotel that, or restaurant that you went to for dinner, Atelier de Vin, where today it's an amazing spot, great view. But that in 95 was a, a totally different place. And... Um, I remember thinking this was a normal and my uncle dropping us and saying, you know, nationally, hey, have a good day. I'll see you later. And I remember this seeming not to be normal. And, um, you know, I thought to myself, like in Canada, where I'd lived now, they would have had to take you for counseling. They would have had to pull you out of school for seeing such a thing. But for us, that was the norm. And you couldn't really complain to anybody or you couldn't really talk to anybody about it because... Everyone in the country at the time had experienced some level of trauma. They've witnessed horrors that you can't even try to bring up. And especially at that time, you wanted to be as, you know, you wanted to practice empathy as much as you could because people had gone through so much. In 2003, my father offered me an opportunity to seek higher education. I went to the U.S., but due to immigration, I wasn't able to seek asylum there. I moved to Canada. In Canada, I attended high school graduated, and um, I remember living with my brother, living in a low-income uh, housing area where opportunities were very little, nothing to inspire teens. Life wasn't easy. We couldn't afford much. Uh, I remember my brother could, could barely afford to keep the lights on. So even being able to ask him for, you know, a pair of Nikes. I love Nikes. I love Air Forces. I wanted to be part of the culture. But this was something of a luxury, so I had to understand that definitely this was something that I couldn't ask for. So fast forward, I finished high school, and uh, I wanted to seek higher learning, but due to the lack of guidance and my family being in Africa, I wasn't able to do this. Uh, I quit my university ambitions and decided to seek sort of non-conventional ways to make money, get the whole drift in uh, most African-American or African-Canadian neighborhoods. But uh, through that process, um, you, know, you know, there was a, a lot of high risk, high reward at the same time. But this took away from me because I wasn't able to connect my family at the time. You know, um, I think a span of seven years went by. And um, looking back today, I understand that I was a product of that environment. But nonetheless, I wanted to make a change. There was something inside of me, the African in me was still beating inside of me and saying, 
you know what? You come from a lineage of very strong people, people who have done amazing things. I was still listening to news about Rwanda. So internally, I needed to find a way for me to be able to move back and uh, do something in Africa. So one of the things that I remember back in uh, Canada that were very consistent in everything that I was going through, transport was never something that you would always question. You know, you knew the bus was always there, the train was always there, it was reliable. You're always going to get to the next place. You're going to go play ball. You use the train. You go for a date, you got the bus. You don't need a car. So that was one thing that I kept on, you know, playing around with in my mind as I was there. Then uh, around 2011, this is when I really started to think about, you know, leaving the, the whole North America side and being able to move back to uh, Rwanda. So at that time, one of my good friends recommended that I should definitely move back and see what I can contribute. I moved back in 2012, very lost, didn't understand what was going on. But the beautiful thing is the country is welcoming. The country wants us to come back and, you know, participate, do our part in, you know, creating a better Rwanda for the future. So I spent about two years doing different odd jobs. I did branding, I did marketing, I sold supplements for two years. Nothing was breaking through. But until one day I met a family friend who was in transport and he mentioned that he had problems with cash collection. Conductors were taking money, so they were losing about 50 to 60% of their revenue. So I thought about the TTC solution that I had used before, but I didn't have the money, I didn't have the technology. So a good friend of mine introduced me to one of the best friends that I've had in life, who gave me an opportunity, who saw me for who I was, whose name is Patrick, he's our CEO, a chairman of the board. And we came together, I had the problem, he had the means to get to technology and money. So we decided, you know what, we need to get together and that's how Tap and Go came to life. And basically Tap and Go is a card that's used for public transport here in Rwanda. We have about 2 million cards sold, we've done 400 million transactions successfully, uh, yeah, the, 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 the data goes on and on, but the team that has done this, always grateful. So when we started, uh, we were just trying to address the issue of transport, but there's a gentleman in the back there called Matteo who will also share his story. We met in Mozambique and he actually told me that I was solving an issue within financial inclusion. I did not have a clue what financial inclusion meant at that time. I heard that word, went home, sat down looked at it and I was like, wow, this actually is something that I'm doing. And um, around 2015 and 16, we started our pilot project. And thanks to the government that's so pro in terms of supporting the young entrepreneurs in, in the country, thanks to the government of Rwanda, we were able to push this solution. And before even the policy was able to regulate us, they allowed us to go and try and fail which is not very normal or common in Africa. I've done this project in a few other countries. Till today, I can say we have not been successful due to policy and regulation. So big ups to the government of Rwanda for supporting us. And uh, at that time, obviously, we became attractive for local banks, private equity, VC, ideal, um, we were the ideal company. Vis-a-vis -vis during the starting, when nobody wants to touch you, nobody wants to take the risk. I mean, someone mentioned it earlier at a panel, how do you support innovation without taking a risk on people who have no track record? Now, in 2020 is one of the stories that I will share that uh, signifies or reflects our downtime. This is where you get to understand yourself. This is where you get to learn yourself. During COVID, we went to complete zero. We had no buses moving. We had no passengers boarding. This is when you're not making any income. I think for some of you who've looked at contracts where they say act of God, force majeure, yes, it came to life. And we finally understood what that meant. So we had to really look deep down inside and come up with solutions to push ourselves. I have to give uh, thanks to the family, the friends, the, you know, the banks, Bank of Kigali, government of Rwanda for creating subsidies to support the, you know, the local companies that were, were struggling, the bus operators who stuck with us, we definitely thank you for all of that as well. And um, just like that, we were able to survive. So quickly, if you could just go to the last page, I wanted to just briefly share with the entrepreneurs a few tools that I think you need to add towards your bag. As I said, it's a marathon as you're running. 
Please incorporate discipline, incorporate hard work, incorporate empathy, dedication. Please have the ability to find the job to be done. Don't just go out there and create just to create. Please go source the problem, create a solution. You will win. And learn to forgive yourself when you fail. You will fail multiple times. <laughs> Actually, you will lose more than you will win. Keep God at the center of what you do because it will keep you humble. It will keep you grounded. Remember to breathe in. Take care of your mental state. Smile as you go through whatever you go through. And as I said, it's a marathon. There is no ending. It will keep going. The minute you think you're successful, that is a trick. That little voice, quiet it down because this doesn't end. Until you, you either retire or God sees fit for you to take off, problems are there. Solutions will be there. Just keep a smile on your face and you got this.